Hey there, everybody. Welcome to another live stream. Uh, today, we've got an awesome guest who's been on the channel before, but we're gonna do a deeper dive and do it live uh, today. So today, we're gonna be chatting with our friend Jay Ritchie. Uh, you may know him as the maker of uh, these wonderful bags, which I love. Uh, he's uh, the, the bag maker be behind Bags by Bird, uh, but also, he's also an adventure filmmaker. So we're gonna talk about a couple different topics today. And before we jump in, um, again, if you guys enjoy this content, consider supporting the channel via Patreon. You will have exclusive access to ask questions of our guests. So uh, with all that said, welcome back to the channel, Jay Ritchie. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for having me and inviting me and hosting. Yeah. I think uh, our last interview was, I don't know, maybe like six months ago. <laughs> it's a lot. It's changed since then. <laughs> At least. <laughs> I know. I think of it as like two years ago. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm, I'm strange. Yeah. But, so um, yeah, we'll, we'll, talk, we'll talk about the bags, but let's uh, talk about some filmmaking stuff first. Has all productions basically shut down in, in Atlanta? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's no... Uh, a lot of my friends who work in the film industry obviously are out of work and trying to find unemployment and... Mm -hmm. Um, those avenues right now. So yeah, things are pretty dead in the city. Um, yeah. So what's been keeping you busy? Is it mostly the, the bag production? Yeah, bags have been um, a really fun project over the last uh, couple of years. Um, definitely more so than the film stuff. Uh, I pick up film projects uh, on the side here and there, um, but the bag stuff is definitely more consistent um and i can create uh my schedule more around that than the film stuff so it usually tends to have priority so. yeah well let's talk about uh before we jump into the bags let's talk about um your role in helping film the latest uh Leo wilcox uh movie i know we spoke to, to spencer but i want to get your end of the story uh so you were asked to operate the drone and the gimbal is that right yeah yeah so um uh the the drone and the gimbal were kind of like uh added kind of layers to the footage uh that uh rue is primarily grabbing um she's such a great documentary kind of filmmaker that she kind of went in for like the close and intimate stuff and i tried to get more of like the the funner movement uh oriented kind of footage um so it was really fun working with both of them and with Brew on trying to capture that. So, yeah. Yeah. What, uh, were you using the GH5 or what, what was uh, your camera you, you were shooting with? Uh, yeah, I was using a GH5 on, I think like a Zenmuse single-handed gimbal. Um, and um, that was kind of like all the gimbal stuff was with that set up on an E mountain bike which um, was pretty fun uh, to use. Um, I, uh, I will forever try to be on one of those full squish e-mountain bikes <laughs> again. <laughs> they're a blast. But uh, for filmmaking, they were a huge, huge help because um, all like so much of your energy is going into trying to study the camera and capture like a good image that you know all like you know pedaling the bike on top of uh trying to keep up with the racers was just uh, a lot and i don't think it could have been doable without an e-bike honestly <laughs> yeah i've done a couple of sheets where <laughs> i've i've filmed off the bike uh, usually a brompton so it's already like small wheels and i'm like pedaling like a hamster and holding the camera using the yeah. body stabilization as much as i can um you know I, yeah and all those times i wish i had an e-bike <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. They are helpful. So, so did the uh, so what tricks have you learned with one-handed gimbal operation? I'm I'm assuming you you rode with one hand and held the gimbal, or did you find a creative mount on the bike? Uh, I have yet to find the creative mount. I've tried making a couple um, mounting to the handlebars that kind of hold it, but it's never. It's so jittery. And um, if you have it mounted on the bars, so my trick was um, uh, kind of like getting on a slight 
kind of downhill. So you're um, obviously not using as much energy to keep up with the rider and getting out of the saddle and using your whole body to basically be suspension for the camera. Um, so if you can kind of just absorb all the energy and bumps with your body, the better the footage was. So even with a gimbal, it helped a lot to kind of just be off the saddle. Yeah. So. <clears throat> That's bonkers. I can't even imagine that. Because <laughs> there's, there's no opportunity to say, hey, can you slow down for just a little bit so I can get a steadier shot? <laughs> yeah, 95% of the time, no. Um, yeah, it's just basically waiting um, for them to come by and uh, thinking you see them and maybe it's a different rider. And, uh, you know, it's a lot of waiting. And, um, yeah, you know, it's... It's a gamble. Each shot is a gamble, and um, you know that's the gift of editing is you can just <laughs> use the best. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I imagine, like you probably in all the waiting, you had you know, enough time to kind of pre-plan the shot, know exactly where you're going to ride, and kind of what the the camera movement was going to be. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it was kind of on the fly, um, but we were trying our best to get ahead of the riders to intercept them. Um, a lot of the time it was a little scrambling, um, because there is such a large pack of riders on the great, um, divide route in that, um, in that race. And, um, it just gets spread out more and more and, um, and, you know, over hundreds of miles. So it's just logistically trying to like intercept it, doing the best you can to intercept it, waiting around and then scrambling, uh, like, you know whenever you see them. So yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious, um, like I've been, uh, kind of a one man band on shoots. How did you prioritize when to work with the gimbal as opposed to the drone? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was tough. I mean, usually, uh, it was, I, I guess like just trying to figure out what type of shots, we needed to get, we kind of had a rough idea of a shot list. So obviously gimbal for more action, kind of intimate, uh, fast paced movement kind of shots and a, a drone for more kind of like uh, landscape, kind of setting, setting the scene a little bit where riders were going or what environment they were in. Um, but, uh, but yeah, um, it was usually in the more wide open spaces the gimbal was nice. I mean, sorry, the drone. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, in the trees, uh, the drone was a little dangerous. <laughs> so. Did you have any close calls with the drone? <laughs> uh, did I? Not this trip. I've definitely had <laughs> them before. I've, uh, when I was uh, filming the Silk Road Mountain Bike Race, I killed my drone. Oh, no. How? Day. How? <laughs> I just slammed it into a wall. <laughs> I slammed it into a cliff and I had to go find it um, up this like hillside to get the memory card. Um, but yeah, it was, it was drama. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, relu I reluctantly uh, bought a drone when we were doing more video production, but I, I never got comfortable flying it um, just because it's, it's so much money that's in the air and so many things can yeah. go wrong. <laughs> yeah, it's the truth. It's super stressful. <laughs> yeah. I remember once we were doing a shoot and um, all of a sudden this eagle came out and started circling the drone and Laura started oh screaming God. at me. She was like, put it down, put it down, put it down. So yeah, it's uh -huh. barely line of sight. So I'm trying to, and it was over water. So I'm backing the drone, uh, you know, back over land and just like dumping it. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Eagles must be so confused or the raptors with all these like new robots flying around. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So what was uh, your most used lens on, um, on your part of the project? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, the GH5 is a micro for thirds mount. So the, the two lenses that I used a lot were like the zoom, uh, kind of 2.8 lenses. There's like a, a 12 to 35 and 35 to 100. Mm -hmm. And those are kind of like my main two lenses because of the zoom, super versatile. They both have stabilization. Um, and, uh, and, uh, you know, for a micro four thirds 
2.8 apertures and that bad but um yeah. those are nice because of the stabilization so mm -hmm. that's so helpful so. yeah yeah, it's a pretty amazing. I mean, it's yeah. when I'm shooting uh, like my end of the the live stream. It's it's so versatile. <laughs> you look great. <laughs> yeah, it's mostly, mostly the lighting. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> cool. Well, let's talk about uh, bags. Um, you know, the this one totally one of my favorites. Um, I'm curious, like, how long were you? making the bag before you felt comfortable enough to sell it to, to other people? Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Um, I probably made a bet like a pile of bags that I was just trying out probably as tall as me um, <laughs> for probably like a year or maybe eight or 10 months before actually selling a bag. Um, it was a lot of, kind of just trying it out on my own and, and bike touring with it and, um, and tweaking it. And it's, yeah, it, it took a long time to feel comfortable to sell because there are so many like great bag makers out there, really skilled people. And, you know, you know, you have, there's a standard that I have to try to aim for. And I'm always trying to get to that higher standard. And that's, that's kind of the fun, fun part about it. So mm -hmm. just trying to keep the quality going up and up. Yeah. What was the hardest part about the learning process? Was it just the learning how to con control control the sewing machine or figuring out the, the right materials or the pattern? Yeah, it's a lot. It's a big learning curve. Um, you know, with the sewing industry not being here in the United States as it was, the resources of just kind of like understanding how sewing machines work, um, you know, like how to troubleshoot things. Like it's pretty hard to find. And there are actually some pretty cool uh, people on YouTube uh, that are delve into like industrial strength sewing machines that are um, um, great resources. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's, that was a big kind of, challenge is trying to like fix my own machines because when I started out, I, you know, I had to like find used machines and like all the machines I had were old industrial machines, probably from the eighties and nineties. And like this machine back here, like I can't find a catalog for this machine. It's like an old Japanese Mitsubishi and I'm going to, I'm going to be like scouring internet forums for probably weeks trying to trying to find like parts for it if it ever breaks and uh probably will have very small luck if uh yeah. finding those so it's tough it's tough like the the industry there's not a ton of support there's not a ton of information out there so it's a lot of kind of just trying to figure it out on your own yeah so where where did you find most of your machines were they ebay finds or craigslist but yeah, um, I found a couple uh, through like old um, kind of auto upholstery shops in the mm -hmm. area, uh, old like BMW shops um, that are kind of going out of business. Um, and then um, uh, just like finding them in the South, like there's old remnants of like, you know, the, the industry out here. And so there's shops that have them laying around and so I drove to like Tennessee to find one. Um, and, you know, I have like a VW Jetta. So it's like a tiny car. And I drove to Tennessee once and ran <laughs> two machines in there. The guys at the shop hated me. <laughs> um, but uh, because they had to try to fit it in my car. But, you know, I, I, uh, I've more recently started develop developing relationships with uh, companies in town that outfit kind of like small manufacturing and like I'm at a point where I actually can have the money to like develop a relationship with them and then um you know have them like reuse their mechanics and stuff like that but it's taken a while to actually kind of build up the capital to do that so. yeah sure um well let's get a little bit of a shop tour because i see a whole bunch of machines i'm assuming they they all do different things that they're not oh uh, just... yeah 
Yeah. So, um, so all my machines are uh, walking foot, or they're meant for heavier duty materials. Like, I'm not gonna sew like shirts or like garments on these. Like, these have a certain type of it's called compound or triple feed walking foot, and so they're made for like upholstery uh, or like really heavy duty kind of things. So, these are this is like a flatbed machine, um, and uh, this is like what I do probably uh, like the first like 50 or 60% of sewing on. And this is kind of like, this is obviously a flat bed. So you do all your flat panels on here. Mm -hmm. So this is like, you know, the bag is composed of a bunch of flat panels that are sewed together in a three dimensional shape. Mm -hmm. And so that first process of just kind of like getting the flat panels and like where the pockets need to be and where the straps need to be attached. Um, that's what we do on this guy. Mm -hmm. And then, um, this guy over here is called a bar tacker, and I just got this guy because m my old one that I bought that was from like the 80s died, um, and there was no parts uh, for it. <laughs> um, so let me let me just <laughs> so I had to bite the bullet, but but this guy is a super cool machine, and this guy makes like all those like really strong um kind of um kind of high okay kind of like a bunch of stitches it's gotcha. called a bar tack um yeah. and so that's that's where like the high stress points uh are reinforced yeah and then um this guy this guy over here the mitsubishi the old japanese one um this guy it's called a, a binding machine, and um, I uh, you can get like um, binding attachments on flatbeds, but um, it takes a long time to set up. This one's kind of dedicated, and so like if you have like a raw edge um, mm -hmm. that that you need covered, you can kind of just put in this guy. I'm not sure if you can see that if it's too bright, but but it's like. Okay. Can you see that? Yeah, yeah. So, so it kind of puts like a uh, like a little edge on it uh, to make it look nice, um, and it helps with also like water protection and kind of containing moisture and stuff like that. Um, and then the last machine, uh, I use four machines uh, through the process, and the last machine is this guy, and this guy is called a barrel arm. And basically, um, it's a, uh, let me get like an example. Sorry. Um, but basically it's a, uh, it's, it's a flatbed, but it's, it's, a uh, it's gotten, they got this like post. Gotcha. And once you have all like the flat pieces, like the panels, like the sides and the main body, um, taking it here, you can kind of like feed it into it and, uh, having it elevated allows you to kind of like um, kind of just feed it in without putting pressure down. Mm -hmm. As Martina from like Swift said the other day, it's like mm -hmm. sewing all day long like really takes a toll on your body. It really does mm -hmm. um, because you're kind of like you're hunched over. You're usually looking down and you're trying to like guide things and like it's a lot of like hand like clamping power and trying to like right. manipulate materials and stuff so like the reasons that these machines are what they are is like to kind of help ease and kind of take the edge off of like um you know taxing kind of processes like this this machine having like a barrel arm mm -hmm. really helps my like the stress of like having to push a bunch of flat panels down to like right. feed into a flatbed so having this elevated, like, kind of takes the stress off of your body, trying to force it down. So if that yeah. makes sense, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know this is, like, super nerdy sewing stuff. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, it's a stuff that, like, I think a lot of people take for granted, you know, because typically it's, you know, whenever I do a, a bag review, especially when it's from a small smaller maker, the first response is, like, well, I could just, you know, buy buy the stuff and the, the raw materials totally. and and sew it for like 10 bucks, right? <laughs> totally, do it. You should do it. <laughs> <laughs>
that's what I that's what I thought too. And then I'm like, oh, this sucks. <laughs> <laughs> And then I tried like 20 more times. I'm like, oh, maybe I'm getting a little bit better. Or yeah. <laughs> getting closer. <laughs> so was there a point where you, you did all this stuff by hand? Or what was the first machine that you invested in? Yeah. So <laughs> the first machine I got. So I'm I'm pretty new at sewing. Like I, I realize that like I have a lot to learn. And I'm constantly learning by people out there that have been sewing for a lot longer than I have. And so I'm, I'm just like starting to learn like about the complexities of like different types of seams and stuff. So I've only, I'm only a couple years into it. And at first, a couple years ago, I bought like a cheap uh, singer on Amazon for like a hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. And um, I just wanted to play around sewing because I'm like a taller guy and I usually have a lot of space underneath like my saddle and my handlebars and um bags that i was finding while working at rivendell or other places like they didn't kind of quite fill that space like i wanted so sewing for me was just kind of like oh i want to just see if i can actually utilize all that space mm -hmm. i have and um so i started sewing from that and i had that singer for a whole year and I didn't oil it or do anything to it. <laughs> I should have oiled it and taken care of it. But um, right, uh, right as I was making a batch of backpacks for Christmas presents, uh, it died. Um, and I was like, uh, I needed to make them and I was like kind of running away with it. So I went down to uh, a, mach a, a sewing machine shop here and I just bought uh, like a walking foot, a Juki, DNU 241 with like this beautiful like gold kind of like bronze paint job on it. It was like, I don't know, maybe from the 80s. Mm -hmm. um, but cost a thousand bucks, a little expensive. Oh, but um, but I just knew that I'd use it um, because I was just sewing a lot and having a really fun time with it. And I used that flatbed walking foot for probably a year. Um, and then just saved up a little bit of money to buy some like used other machines like the Bartacker and like the binding machine. And then those started dying off because they're old anyway. So right. <laughs> it's just been, but yeah, the, the, the shop is, um, doing pretty well right now, but yeah, yeah it's it took a while to get here. Yeah. So it sounds like, I mean, you've you have to invest like a fair amount of, of capital in, in machines. Like what's like, what's the average cost per, per machine? Yeah. So like the, like a used walking foot, um, like on eBay, I can like, you can find them for like six, 700 bucks. Um, walking foots are usually a little bit more expensive than like a straight, like needle feed or like something that, that like you would do with garment making. Bag makers also use a lot of kind of like, um, needle feed, which is um, kind of like what people usually think of when they see a sewing machine, kind of like mm -hmm. feed area. Yeah. Um, um, but uh, those you can find for like four or 500 bucks to use on eBay, industrial ones. But, um, you know, like, oh, like, so like all these, like most of these are used, all of them are used or ex except the bar tacker, which um, it's pretty hard to find those used in good condition. So uh, these are not cheap. This is like, you know, this is a, like a used car. So oh, dang. it's like four, yeah. four or five grand. So oh, wow. yeah. that's, that's the thing. It's like, yeah, with like bag making, um, if you want to kind of use bar tax as a way to reinforce things, like you have to like make an investment in a bar tacker. And that's usually when people get into bag making is because like you're like okay now i gotta pay this off <laughs> <So> <laughs> a lot of people a lot of people like eli from like ruth works like he he makes it work without bar tackers like he's just skilled enough of a craftsman that he he's found ways to like work around it um the design that i do kind of requires a bar tacker so that's just kind of like you know the program i'm on yeah so but 
yeah, all these machines are kind of like from finding like used ones in the south and like driving hours and like backwoods kind of places and talking to right. people and trying to find them so uh, but yeah it's it's there's an adventure usually with every machine so right it sounds like yeah. a, a Ameri that show american pickers where they go and <laughs> to, to yeah. people's garages <laughs> it totally is it's like yeah <clears throat> Uh, that's like pretty that. like i had no no idea like some of those machines uh cost that that much so i can see where you know as a bag maker you know when you make that decision to to invest in, in a machine like that you know it, you have to price the product so you can make make it back in a reasonable amount of time yeah yeah i mean they're it's a good investment i mean they're gonna like industrial sewing machines should last decades um if you take care of them so yeah it's a good investment but um it is a lot of capital um and like i definitely had to save up for them um but i think they're gonna last me a long time so yeah so how how has business been been going has it exceeded your expectations or how is it y yeah yeah it's i mean i've been sewing for almost two years now maybe two and a half no no like one and a half sorry mm -hmm. and like the first year uh it was pretty slow like just kind of like getting out maybe like five or ten orders a month and kind of just building up my skills and kind of working my connections or networking with the right people to kind of get the bags on the right bikes um and i feel really lucky to have connections like Daniel and like past and people in bikepacking.com. So, um, for those kind of like that exposure and over the last maybe like six months, um, I've been selling out of my pre-orders. Um, so that's been great. And there's been a little bit less interest now that like with COVID stuff and that's totally understandable as people kind of tighten up. Um, but, um, as, other bag makers are experiencing too, like smaller bag makers is like now people are kind of like trying to invest in like smaller companies and locally. So, um, there's the, the interest is going back up again. So. Yeah. But, yeah. Cool. So what's your current, um, uh, cap per month? And is that because that's just, it would take up all your time to, to do any more? Yeah. So, I like with the the advertising on online like I I have about 20 spots that I have open and uh that's kind of direct sales and um and that takes me a couple weeks to make um but I also have accounts like with wholesale um like Crumworks in Japan is my dealer in Japan um they're in Tokyo Crumworks um and uh and I have other like wholesale accounts. Uh, so I'm also trying to fulfill those mm -hmm. orders as well. And um, it's a combination of direct sales and wholesale that I can kind of like make it work financially. So um, if I think if it was strictly wholesale, I don't know how I could do it. I don't know how, <laughs> I don't like Swift and like other like larger companies, like their knowledge of production and like sourcing materials. And like, I'm just, I, it's amazing. Like, I don't know how they, <laughs> like their price points are great and their production is really really good so i mean yeah. i admire their ability so yeah cool uh well i think i'm going to open up uh the interview to questions so if you're in the zoom and you found the blue hand um feel free to raise it and you can ask your question to jay uh i'll <laughs> scroll through the youtube chat really quick uh let me know if you're in the youtube chat where you're uh watching from Okay, we've got a question from Steve. Uh, Steve, you should be unmuted. Yeah, yeah there we go. Um, <laughs> first of all, Jay, uh, I, uh, I love the monkey wrench shirt. I'm over uh, not too far from <laughs> Maha, so those guys are great. Good yeah. to see you repping. Um, kind, of a, kind of a two part question. Can you walk us through? You've got a couple of different products, like w how you're how your production process works and how you kind of try and make that as efficient as possible. And then, you know, how many hours do you estimate to make 
like a large gold back just so mm-hmm. people kind of get an idea like you know the quality of product and the time that it takes yeah for sure so um so the production process and how i kind of keep that efficient um is uh i usually batch it all together uh, i think um i usually do it in batches of so like 20 to 30 and that takes me most of a month and um so i start with like my patterns and i have like a, a catalog of patterns that i've developed for the different sizes and bags that i have and i just kind of trace out it on um, the fabric and i cut it so like i'm hand cutting uh all this stuff and uh uh it's not very efficient (laughs) Um, (laughs) honestly Um, there are a lot more efficient ways to do it and i think like with larger companies um you know people can like kind of like do laser cutting or die cutting on their patterns and um i know like oveda negra does like um die cutting die cutting which is like basically like a big kind of like uh, cookie cutter and they kind of just create the parts of the bags uh, by doing that um, I'm just doing it with scissors um, and then doing it in batches really helps because you when you sit down in a, at a machine for hours like you kind of just don't want to get up you kind of want to have things piled up and uh, you kind of do it a bunch of steps at once for a particular machine and so you kind of just um with it being in a batch you can kind of like speed that up because you're just staying put and you're not moving around as much um um and uh so with the the bags that i sell there it's kind of like a i'm trying to like float this in between production kind of custom area where i have like production sizes and bags available in custom colors. And, um, you know, I have maybe uh, like a dozen or 15 or so fabrics that you can choose from and a couple different liners you can choose from. Um, So that's kind of something that I offer as like a bit of like a custom appeal to the bag. But production wise, that's tough because like I have to like cut out different colors of different bags and then kind of like organize them and make sure everything's accounted for with all the customers and their orders. So that's inefficient. And that's like, you know, um, like for example, like, you know, larger companies, they have like a bag that you can buy off on their website. And like, it probably comes in like a couple of colors and like, it's ready to ship and they make those in big batches where they just have all the same material. Um, and that's a a more efficient way to do it, but, um, I'm choosing to be a little bit less efficient and appeal to people that want to explore different colors and materials. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the time of like the amount of time it takes, I mean, I would say it probably takes like two to three hours for bag actually sewing um there are probably a couple hours of work behind that of like taking photos doing all the website stuff talking to customers i talked to a lot of customers make sure bags are fitting well you know the sizing is clear and everybody understands that so like there's a lot there's a lot other than sewing that um is a uh, you know is is that goes into each bag so yeah cool is that is that helpful is that good (laughs) yeah cool uh let's see brian's got a question here brian you are unmuted (laughs) okay cool thank you Uh, i actually have two questions the first one is uh, how did you get started in photography and filming or which one did you get started in and how did it progress to the other Uh, and the second question is are you, are you tired of answering questions about all the drama on the tour divide last year? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So the visual stuff, um, 
photography and the video stuff, like I, I'm, I think I was one of the last classes in high school that had an actual photo class with a dark room. And once I found that, like junior year of high school, I was in there all the time. I was just in that dark room. Um, I just loved it. And it was a really fun way to express myself when I was a kid. And, um, and then, you know, always kind of had that and shot film um, and stuff um, through my 20s. And, um, and then working at Rivendell, um, kind of like mid late twenties, um, I started doing more kind of video content for them because they needed instructions for how to like install their racks and like how to wrap bar tape and stuff like that. So the video stuff kind of, uh, kind of got some momentum off of that. Um, and then we just started playing around with more like Rivendell kind of fun videos and that evolved into just some more kind of writing videos. Um, yeah. Um, and then the drama, yeah, I'm that, yeah, with a tour divide and um, and the online kind of drama around that, I it was it was a tough time, and I it took me like two weeks to kind of decompress from that trip, from the stress, um, like the stress of trying to chase riders down. Um, at all hours of the day and um, and uh, and just constantly be going with that and then adding a layer of like online um, kind of drama on top of that was just like, it was a lot. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, when I landed in Tucson after that at my friend Jonathan's house, um, I just like basically like hung out on his hammock for two days and just drink beer and swim <laughs> in his pool and swim in his pool. <laughs> I can. I, I was not very good at talking after that. <laughs> so, <laughs> it was a lot. Um, but. Yeah, cool. Well, you know, true story, Jay. Uh, watching your your mini Rivendell videos. That's actually what got me into making videos on YouTube. I saw the little explainer <laughs> videos. I was like, I can do that. So I bought like a, a flip camera and started making videos. So yes. everything's full circle. <laughs> Oh my God. Yeah. You're doing so much better than me, man. You're kicking ass. <laughs> this is great. Yeah. Cool. Any um, other questions in the zoom? Uh, let's see who's in the chat. I actually see some, um, locals to you. We've got Reed Passmore, uh, Devin's oh, hey, in the Reed. chat, uh, hey, folks from, uh, Phoenix, uh, from Missoula, Greensboro, San Antonio. Uh, um, Cool. If you guys have any questions for Jay, let me know in the in the chat. Uh, South Dakota is here, uh, Tulsa, Montreal, uh, sweet, San Francisco, Albuquerque, awesome. So pretty pretty good group of people in um, in the chat here. Uh, any other questions in the Zoom? Uh, raise your 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 blue hand. Uh, so I'm curious, like what what would be the next step to help you grow your business? Would it be getting another machine or hiring another employee? Or what, what's kind of the, the next efficiency to eke out? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, so when I was thinking about like starting a sewing business a couple of years ago, like I mentioned Eli from Ruthworks, um, I crashed his, like his shop one day in San Francisco when I was, uh, and he, he's, he's an awesome guy and he, uh, just kind of explained that he didn't want to be big. He just wanted to be him. And he didn't want to give a, you know, a shit about like chasing, you know, like down the big companies that resell your stuff or uh, mm -hmm. wanting to, you know, be a bigger company. Like he just wanted to make his own schedule and sew bags when he could and kind of like have that smaller kind of presence. And I'm honestly like, being in the bike industry for a while and seeing kind of like smaller company and being within smaller companies, like they're great, but like, that's a lot of stress on the person running them. And like, I'm just not sure if I'm that person or if I'm ready for, to be that person, but I'm really enjoying kind of keeping it small. Um, it's usually me sometimes uh, if I'm having like hand issues, and stuff I pull in people and I do have people that help me cut um, and I contract that out because it's part of my body 
And uh, so I do have some help kind of like supplementing like the production, but all the sewing, like all the, like the, the main sewing I do. So I think just kind of keeping it with maybe another helper to, it's kind of where yeah. I want to be right now. Yeah. I mean, that's a good kind of, you know, realization to make about yourself. Like what, how much more like stress and responsibility do I really want to take on rather than being kind of seduced that, you know, you, you have to grow, you have to get more employees and get bigger. Um, I know for us, it's, there's a point where we're doing a lot of uh, paid video work. I was like, oh, you know, we're kind of a quasi video production company now. Maybe we should hire another person on. Uh, but the bigger the shoots got, like the more stressful it became. Yeah. And I was like, you know, yeah. I'd, I'd be okay just doing YouTube videos. If I can somehow make that, you know, sustainable and we didn't have to get any bigger, it could just be Laura and I, I'd be perfectly okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. It gets stressful pretty quickly. I feel I f like with Martina the other day, I just felt for her, like, I can't imagine what she's going through and the responsibility that she has for her employees. And during this time, like, yeah, that'd be really tough. And I'm not sure if I'm ready for, I mean, that's like, she's, you know, 10 or 12 years down the line yeah, in the progression of this business. But um, yeah, I don't know. It's, being having like having responsibility for those people just in this time or just in general would be a lot working at rivendell and kind of seeing that stress on grant was a lot you know mm -hmm. him yeah. feeling responsible for like the 11 or 12 people that were there so yeah cool uh we got a question in the chat here from tb what is your favorite bike <laughs> oh do you want uh my favorite bike right now do you want to do you want to see my new um, Donald Hofer? Sure. Uh, oh I'm yeah. Calling it the, I'm calling it the Chiller uh, <laughs> because I know uh, there are some francophones out there that love. <laughs> but this guy right here is a. Uh, here I'm just gonna pull it in, but um, I'm living that supple life to the fullest, nice. and I'm, <laughs> I have a. It's a. Is that it? Wait. So um, I have this uh, this kind of flat bar bike. Like I was saying with sewing, um, it's hard on the body. And I have noticed that my hands on drop bars, uh, I'm starting to get carpal tunnel. So oh, wow. I've had to convert yeah. all my bikes to like flat bar yeah. with like ergon grips. Um, mm -hmm. So that really helps my hands with sewing. And then um, obviously having uh, these big G1, like, 29 2.35s are super cush um but nice. this is my this is my favorite bike right now this thing is really really fun so cool yeah i think but, I, I i got a chance to meet him at a philly bike expo for a hot second <laughs> yeah yeah he makes great bikes yeah <laughs> yeah it's funny that um you, you bring up carpal uh -oh. tunnel Sorry. like i'm the the complete opposite Sorry. uh where video editing um has me where if, if I ride a, a flat bar bike for too long, then it starts to aggravate my carpal tunnel. So that's why I tend to ride bikes in the drops just because having the hands in this position is a little bit easier mm. on my hands. Um, yeah. Interesting. So let's see. Matt Thomas asks, what's what's your process been for designing? Sorry, uh, I can't hear you. Okay. Are you good? Hello? <laughs> hey, I didn't hear that last part. Okay. Um, so, my thing got disconnected. Yeah. So we got a question from uh, Matt Thomas in the the chat, and he asks, uh, "What's your process for designing a new bag, and um, and do you have any bits of wisdom for sewing bike bags at home?" <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, process for designing. Um, it's always that's probably like my favorite part. Uh, like of the whole business is kind of chasing down um sorry i think your earbuds sorry, just died my... <laughs> sorry my headphones are kind of going out yeah are you there yeah design connected okay um but uh yeah designing uh, a bag is a uh, takes me like months usually. Um, I've been working on like kind of like a frame bag for about six months. Um, and 
Um, it's just I probably have made like 14 of them or oh, 15 wow. of them so far, just trying different trying different versions out, trying like a different size. But uh, for designing them, something that I've found to be really helpful is uh, this stuff called RAM board. Hmm. And it's like, a, it's like a temporary flooring for construction sites. Um, and it's kind of like this thicker board. It's thicker than like a, like a construction paper. Mm -hmm. But you can find this at Home Depot and like you can cut your patterns out. And, uh, and that is really helpful for kind of like uh, kind of laying stuff out. I also like have, you know, like these are all my patterns to the bags. And these are all made of like a HDPE plastic. So mm -hmm. these are a little bit tougher, but trying to find like a good way to have a pattern and like having it cut out is good because like it's obviously the history of it. And then you can kind of like tweak it and adjust as like you you make them and uh, need to kind of like trim things or right. uh, dial it in. So, yeah. so um, if, if someone then, were to get started in, in sewing, like how much, like how much money would they have to spend on, on the sewing machine? Yeah. I mean, you can probably find that uh, singer okay. on Amazon uh, if you want to, up on amazon but like they sell singers they have like a the they have one that's called like heavy duty like 4423 or 22 and just to kind of get your teeth cut on sewing that's a great kind of place uh to start and then just start like buying materials from probably like rocky woods or um um outdoor wilderness fabrics up in washington um so um and uh yeah just start piecing things together and playing, having fun playing with origami. You know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so. yeah. I'm curious, like what's the, uh, what's the most popular color um, that you sell your bags in? Oh no, did we lose Jay? Okay. I think we lost Jay for a second. Um, so hopefully you guys are enjoying the chat so far. I think Jay will hopefully join in. Otherwise, um, yeah. So let me know uh, in the YouTube comments if you guys have any other questions. Um, hopefully I'll ask Jay when he, we pop back on. Um, but like I said, um, Bags by Bird Bag, you know, not sponsored, you didn't pay me to, to, to promote his bags or anything, but definitely uh, one of my favorites. I think, uh, you know, if you're not happy with the, the butt bags because they waggle too much or because they're too hard to stuff, then you know a bag you know like like jay's is a is a great option um you know one of the things i like uh specifically about uh the bags that jay makes is hold on i'm trying to get them back on the line here sorry about um, that. <laughs> is that uh they hold their form you know so if it's it's empty it, it doesn't look like a, a big flaccid thing on your on your bike. Welcome back, Jay. Yay. <laughs> I was just, sh I was just shilling your bags, man. You <laughs> only at the time. Uh, so I think I asked what, what's Thanks been that? that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I should, I should dislocate, disconnect some more. Yeah. <laughs> Oops. Dropping the call again. Um, so what's your, uh, what's the most popular <laughs> color that you sell? Uh, the, this like black camo, uh, okay. this is like really popular. This, it kind of, it's like a, it goes with everything. Um, right. <laughs> but if, uh, people aren't into camo, which I understand why people wouldn't be, um, like the marigold is also really popular right now. Thanks mm -hmm. to, uh, outer shell. Okay. Kinda yeah. Got, uh, dimension polyvent to make this color again. So. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, well, let's see. Any other questions in the Zoom? Let me know. Uh, you can raise your your blue hand. Uh, we got one from Alyssa. So, um, unmuted. Go. Uh, hey, Jay. Um, Hi. I was actually uh, curious. 
since you were mentioning having some problems with your hands, if you're doing anything to um, kind of take care of those, like exercises or stretches or anything like that? Yeah, um, I have kind of doing more kind of like mid back and upper back kind of exercises. That helps a lot. And I think like you're... there's some like stretches with uh, uh, is. Is it disconnecting again? Sorry. Do you not hear me? I can, you're good. I can. We can hear you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, it's that, and then um, just making sure I take breaks in between batches, um, because just like the everyday use, uh, kind of just builds up over time, and then I usually have to take a couple days off. So. But yeah, yeah. Well, take it easy a little bit. <laughs> Any other questions in the in the Zoom or the YouTube chat? Uh, let me know. Let's see. Traveling through, loving the show. Uh, <laughs> Tim Donner stoked. Um, what else we got here? So Christian Bisner asks, "Are you going to offer frame frame bags one day?" It sounds like you're working on the frame bag frame bag do you have any sense of when you might finalize the design and and put into production yeah so i've been working on a partial frame bag um full frame bags like custom frame bags honestly scare me <laughs> <laughs> um i don't have like a a great system like rock guys or rogue panda has like they have it dialed um and um i just I'm playing around with different systems, but I haven't figured out one that works well for me. And I'm just not sure if that's like the game I want to get into. I'm, so I'm thinking like partial frame bag might be a little bit more straightforward, having it adapt to different geometries out there. Um, so I've been playing around with uh, this idea. Um, it's here, I can show you on this bike, but this is like basically like a, can you see that? Mm -hmm. it's like a it's a half frame bag uh -huh. uh, it looks really small on this bike because this bike is so gigantic this is like a 64 top tube 64 c tube so <laughs> it's uh it's it's a little bit bigger in real life <laughs> um but this one's like about 12 inches long so it should take about half of your half of your triangle um and something with bxb that i've been trying to pursue is uh not using zippers because i've seen so many fail uh just covering different rides like uh riding events and then my own zippers failing so i um i'm kind of like working on this like flap design that um basically there's oh god uh there's two <laughs> there's two flaps there's two flaps in this one on each side and this one's a full size compartment um and um, and then like there's uh, another flap on the other side. That's just uh, basically uh, kind of for like a wallet or phone. It's right. uh, slim. And then um, and then I kind of am playing around with like uh, my pleat technology. Um, <laughs> so and uh, it's like this. It's basically like a fold right here that um, kind of allows it to kind of expand and kind of bulge in this okay. like kind of toward the bottom. Um, and uh, that's kind of a, the sweet spot where your foot is right here and like you're, you're kind of like your ankles passing by here. So there's a lot of clearance. Um, so that's kind of the idea behind that. And then I've been using these uh, magnetic kind of buckles uh, right here, so. Um, yeah. these are pretty, these are pretty easy for like kind of one handed closures. And I kind of started making this bag because I just wanted to have like a, like a good bag for kind of day rides that's kind of in the frame because, um, it's just nice and compact and kind of low to the ground, mm -hmm. um, and not flopping around like on your bars as much. So, um, yeah, um, it's, cool. I, I've been, I made the, like the design and the pattern kind of to be, uh, around like a kind of flatter top tube, more traditional 
uh, geometry bikes. Um, so, yeah. So tell me those, more about uh, uh, tell me more be, about zipper uh, failures. Do they just <laughs> go left and right when you go to these events? <laughs> <laughs> they do. Yeah, I I think it's uh, with like just kind of days in and days out of like kind of touring, uh, like all the gunk kind of gets in there, um, dirt and um, and people just are prone to overstuffing them. But so you know, it, they just pop. Um, there's a lot of great zippers out there with like big teeth, like Rock Geist uses and like Revelate used um, that are really bomber. Um, but um, yeah, I just I'm <laughs> trying to trying to do something different. So, yeah, cool. Yeah. Uh, I think Brian's got another question, so you've got the floor. Yeah, I was just looking at your website. I was curious if you had anything that fit a uh, a wall one thirty seven basket. I was just looking I through some of your stuff here. I don't have any basket bags right now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, there's a lot of great options out there. Swift obviously makes that sugar loaf. Um, uh, Wizard Works in London, they make a really cool basket bag right now. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Mm. yeah I, my lineup is pretty limited. Um, <laughs> having like a lineup like Swift or you know other bag makers and all those designs it would be great someday but it's i can only design yeah. some in here right now so. <laughs> cool so i think i'll wrap up with one last question um as a okay. as a bag maker um you know when you look at the bag making industry like what are the hot trends is it in fabrics or is it in new closures like where's the innovation in in, in bags Hmm. Yeah, I think uh, I think uh, people are obviously trying to go lighter weight, so people are trying to move away from racks and the weight added to that uh, by those. Um, so I I feel like that's like a like a fun kind of place to explore and chase down and trying to like kind of create a bag that has uh, like a, it carries a lot of its own kind of like a shape and uh clearance and how you mount it um yeah other trends i don't know man there there are so many cool except uh, i've noticed like the like volet straps have you know quietly infiltrated you know the custom bag scene you know used to be leather straps or or just webbing and then all of a sudden bam people are like repurposing it for for things that were like beyond its intentional use or intended use yeah 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 i think scott from porcelain rocket was the first one to use those in like his frame bags um yeah he he started he's you know like normal he was way ahead of the curve on pretty much everything yeah. <laughs> bag related bike packing so is there um, um but yeah is there like a trade magazine that people that work in um you know creating uh bags that show that showcases the latest closures and stuff like the fidlocks and all those things. Like how, how do, how do people learn about those? Yeah, there probably are. I, <laughs> I don't know about them. No, like, uh, like, Fidlock, ba- like bag uh, fancy or something. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I would totally read that magazine. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, well, fidlock and like the magnetic closures, like those, have been bouncing around in the bag making world for a little bit. Um, and I have a few friends here that also make bags. So, um, they had some fidlocks and, uh, like magnetic closures. So, um, I o- ordered like a bunch of samples a while ago and tried some out and, and, uh, but yeah, they're really cool. Honestly, uh, like a fidlock, like th- that fidlock is great, but like just a regular gator hook, mm-hmm. and, you know, it works just about as good. And it's like, you know, really low technology, um, <laughs> but it's not as, it doesn't have a magnet. So it's not as cool. <laughs> right. And every bag I have with a Fidlock, I just play with it all day. Just <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah. Sometimes, sometimes going to like uh, suppliers here, um, they have like cool kind of like magnet technology. And I saw one that's like a magnetic zipper. Oh, wow. And you kind of just take two sides, and you kind of have it go. <laughs> I was I was playing that with for like with a, for 
for like 20 minutes so they're, <laughs> they're, they're mesmerizing yeah yeah um, Cool. Uh, well, I think uh, I'm going to wrap it up here. Thank you so much, Jay, for, for joining us. Um, if you guys want to learn more about his bags, um, check out his website. He's on the gram. What's your Instagram handle? It's at bags X bird. Bags X bird. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and if you're curious about his bags, I've done a couple of deep dives, some reviews comparing it to uh, sausage bags. You guys know where, where my preference lies. Uh, so thanks again, Jay, for, for joining us. And if you guys yeah. like this content, don't forget to, uh, subscribe. We've got lots of fun live streams coming up. Any last words? Uh, no, just thanks a lot for tuning in and, uh, yeah, have fun, um, riding your bike during quarantine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cool. On thanks, that everybody. note. Yeah. Keep the supple side down. All right. All right. Thanks.